We are recording. Attendance. Brian is here. Curry is online. Darby is here. Fisher. Fisher is not here. Hamilton's here. Hellman is online. Ashley is here. The Millers are here. No Norris yet. Collins, not here. Saunders is online. Shamblin is here. Argus is here. And Young is online. That is okay. All right, it's eight o'clock. Um, we'll do announcements first, I guess. It's, I assume at least one more person is going to show up. But anyway, uh, so the exams obviously are done. They're a lot lower than I thought they would be. So again, I'm not going to let you guys retake the exam. But there still has to be one more person to take it. So once that person takes the exam, then you guys retake the exam. And that person will take a harder version. So I want to make sure it's fair. So for those of you who are wondering about that, um, what else? And yeah, like I said in the announcement, you can still retake the first exam until someone has the uh, a meeting with me where I get them feedback and say, you know, basically get them all the right answers. Because remember, the final exam is going to be written, well, half of it's going to be from the first three exams. So literally take questions from the first three exams, copy them and paste them verbatim the exam exact questions. So you're going to want to study these exams. If we're, if we're done with exam one, we're done with exam two, but you guys should still study those because they will be on the final. And also, really, a lot of this is cumulative, right? Like, you can't truly understand, you know, photosynthesis and respiration, which we just did. You can't truly understand that unless you truly understand chemistry, right? So, yeah, any questions about that? All right. Um, lab should be normal this week, as far as I know. Um, the materials should be here, so we should be doing that photosynthesis and respiration lab. What else for attendance? So, That's will it. the lab report be due next week? No, lab, great question. So, it's a reminder your lab report, and I'll remind you of them this in writing. Your lab report will be due two weeks after you get your graded lab back. So, Wednesday we do the lab, Friday it's due. In a perfect world, I'm going to grade it on Saturday, but I won't, um, you know, to give you guys time to do it. But uh, yeah, so let's just say I, I grade it on Saturday and you get your grade back. I'll say in it, you know, here's your score. And your lab report is not in which weeks. Make sense? So thank you for asking this question. And you can start it. That's also a good time to remind you that. Like the lab report itself, the majority of it isn't even, you can write it even without doing the experiment. The abstract, well, sort of. The abstract won't be full, but you can do the introduction, the materials and methods. You can start. You might have to adjust it after you've actually done the experiment. In case what you did was different goals right now. But anyway, anything else? That's a great question. Independent work. You should have 60 points by now. It is now worth 13 points of age. It's, you know, technically in the syllabus it says it's worth 10 points. And then to bribe you guys to start doing it early, which some of you have, one person has already finished the assignment. Um, I said it was worth 15 points. And I said it was worth 14.9 and 14.5. And now it's worth 13. And that number is going to keep dropping. So right during independent work. What else? Really trying to slow things down to see if anybody else shows up, but I don't think it can happen. Any uh, well, Fisher's online. So there we go. Um, anyway, any, any questions about anything? All right, let's jump into the next chapter. Then. So the next chapter is all about cellular reproduction. So, the last chapter, the last whole exam, pretty much, it's about energy, right? How we how we change energy from one form to the other. I mean, that was one of the problems of life. Um, and this one is all about reproduction. Oddly enough, actually, in the last textbook, this used to be one chapter. So this new textbook has been broken down into two chapters. It used to be mitosis and meiosis were the same discussion, same chapter. You were breaking it down. Um, I did keep the old PowerPoints in the last textbook. So it is in a slightly different order, but I think I want to keep it that way. Um, about, I think I see the benefit of it now that you can read your textbook and learn it that way, or you can learn it the way I'm teaching it, and I'm giving you the same information just in a different way. So let's get into it. Speaking of the old textbook, your, your new one does not have this, your old one does. Let's do the guessing game. See if I know what this is. Not that I expect you to, I'm just curious to see if anyone does. I know what those are. They're boogers. No, I'm just kidding. That's uh, 
chromosomes. There's a picture of chromosomes. You're going to learn all about chromosomes. We talked about chromosomes before. We talked about them in chapter, the biological mo molecules chapter, when we talked about DNA and RNA and you know, all the nucleotides. We also talked about it a little bit when we talked about cells. So it's just a little bit of a review. How about this? Any guesses what this is? Well, forget the orange thing. I mean, obviously, what's this picture without the orange thing? What, what's that a picture of? Yeah, it's like an x ray of someone's lung, right? That being said, any guess what the orange thing is? Again, not what I expected, right? I was curious to see if maybe anyone can guess. It's a tumor, so is cancer. And in this chapter, you're going to learn the basics about cancer. And I think it's one of the more important things that you're ever going to learn because cancer touches a lot of people. So, again, these are sadly. Probably you're going to get it one day or somebody you know um, is going to have cancer one day. And this will give you the basics, right? So when you do have to learn about it, you do go to the oncologist and try to determine which treatment to do and try to learn how, you know, how the cancer works. This gives you the, the basic foundation. How about this? You should know what this picture is. We've seen it before. Any idea what that's a picture of? Talked about, we saw it in chapter three, we saw it in the, in the cell chapter. No guesses? That's DNA. So we're going to obviously talk a lot about DNA. And then your book, or the old textbook, has a picture of her because uh, the textbook pointed out that if you were to take one piece of, like one chromosome um, out of one of your cells and stretch it out, it would probably be six, about six feet long. So anyway, another thing that's not in your textbook, and I kept it in the PowerPoint, I'm not going to talk about it because I'm not going to test you on it. But um, there was, they talk about this virgin birth of a shark. So there's something called parthenogenesis, and you can look that up. How many of you guys have seen the original Jurassic Park? Yeah, do you remember how like they said, oh, they're all females that won't reproduce, and then they did? Um, that's actually a real thing. That's, that happens in some animals. You can look it up for any kind of work. Obviously, the shark did it, so it was a female and basically cloned herself. But there's other other animals too. So if you want to look it up for an event word, could be a short paper, like here's all the animals that we know that do it, or you could really dive into it and write more about it. It's up to you. Anyway, now we're finally into the important stuff. Here we go. So this chapter is basically I'm breaking it down into two big two chunks. Um, first, we're gonna talk about just the big overview, like what cellular reproduction accomplishes in general. And then we'll actually talk about the cell cycle and mitosis. So again, this is a little bit of out of order from the way your textbook presents it. So this information I'm going to give in this first bullet point, again, this is a big overview. Um, but make sure you take notes if you're a note taker, because some of this, again, is a little bit out of order. First of all, you need to know what reproduction is, or what it does, right? Reproduction may result in the birth of a new organism, but more often involves the production of new cells. Actually, I wish I would have, I would have used you before I put that slide, uh, slide up and say, how many of you have reproduced? So how many of you have reproduced? Let's raise their hand. But again, that's incorrect. So you need to think about this in a different way. As you're sitting here right now, you're reproducing. You might not be creating a new organism, but you are creating new cells. As you're sitting here right now, you're reproducing. So keep that in mind. You need to relearn what uh, what you think about the word reproduction. Anyway, cells undergo something called cellular reproduction um, or cell division. I don't care what you call it. Just know what it is when I use it. And that's basically what we're going to talk about for the next two chapters. And in this process, at least for this chapter, there are two daughter cells that are produced. And if you've done the lab, and I'm off the top of my head, I think everybody has, if you've done the lab, you know this, right? Uh, mitosis leads to two daughter cells. That will be a test question because you will need to differentiate between mitosis and meiosis, and that was one of the differences. When we're talking about mitosis, the result is two genetically identical daughter cells. So make sure you know that. They're literally just a copy of well the first cell so you have one cell it splits into two and those two are genetically identical to each other so any questions about that all right another word that you need to know that you probably should know we've talked about it already is chromosomes you need to know what a chromosome is you're going to be sick of chromosomes probably for this next exam this next exam is pretty much all about chromosomes when you think about it First, we're going to talk about mitosis, which is the type of cellular reproduction. Then we're going to talk about meiosis, which is the type of cellular reproduction. Then we're going to talk about genetics, which is all about inheritance, which is all about the chromosomes that you got from your parents or that you passed down to your kids. It's all about chromosomes. Anyway, before cellular reproduction can happen, the cells have to duplicate the chromosomes. So we're going to talk about that 
in a little bit more detail later in the chapter. So for now, again, it's just a big overview. Your point, uh, your book, both the old one and the old textbook point out the cellular division plays a role in the lives of organisms, right? Whether we're talking about replacing lost or damaged cells or growing, right? Like how many of you are the same size you were when you were born, right? None of you, much less the same size you were when you uh, were first conceived, right? So you have to grow. And then again, eventually, like I said, when I first asked, I said, how many of you reproduced and wanted to raise your hand? You were probably thinking about that type of reproduction, right? Creating a new organism. So any questions about this slide? All right, this next slide is a picture of what's on this slide. All right, so just, just an example here, we have a cell replacement in the human kidney cells. Um, like I said, growth, right? You used at one point in your life, you were one cell, and then that turned into two, and that turned into four, and that turned into eight, and that turned into 16, right? And that's, that's how you grow. Um, and then there's this stuff we can read about this too. Um, we don't focus much on it, we're more human centric um, in this next book. But yeah, like single celled organisms, that's how they reproduce, right? Through cellular division. And then things like this. And this is, I think, an interesting topic for independent work, right? Clippings and then some animals. Like, for example, that sea star. If you cut the arm off that sea star, the arm will grow a new sea star. And also, the sea star will grow a new arm, right? So you can basically make two organisms by cutting the arm off of the sea star. And they're clones of each other. They're, they're genetically identical. Um, other examples include like uh, sponges, which is technically an animal. If you were to take a sponge, push it through a sieve, you know, just have thousands of little cells. Each one of those little cells would turn into a new sponge. They would all be genetically identical to that first one. And of course, clippings. I think that's also pretty handy. I've actually done that a lot. You buy some spices or some herbs or Kroger. And then you want to grow it yourself, you put it in some water, they grow some roots, then you put it in the some soil. Anyway, any questions about that? Again, great reproductive um, independent work topics if you want to look into it. Like what animals can do that for you to do the regeneration? Or what plants are easier to grow with a clipping? Some of them require a lot of work. Anyway, there's no questions about that. Let's talk about asexual reproduction, which is what this chapter is all about. You need to know this. Again, a lot of the exam is going to be differentiating between the difference between asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction so asexual reproduction you know non-sexual that means there's going to be no egg and no sperm you need to know that oh sorry i guess let's do a tennis words too uh the first tennis word will be egg so anyway yes you need to know that when we're talking about asexual reproduction and there's going to be no egg or sperm involved. The parents and the offspring have identical genes because they're it's literally just a clone, a perfect copy. Mistakes do happen. We'll talk about that. This is how single cell organisms reproduce. And as I mentioned in that earlier slide, and here it is again in writing, sometimes multicellular um, organisms can also be reproduced that way. I'm going to put an X to this big bullet point here. It is interesting, in my opinion, but you don't need to know that. I'm not going to ask you anything about that. Again, great independent work topic. We'll get to it. But yes, for asexual reproduction, know those three bullet points, especially the first two. Any questions? Another thing you need to know about asexual reproduction is if it is mitosis. So when we're talking about it, asexual reproduction, we are talking about mitosis. You need to know that. Not meiosis. Meiosis is the thing we're going to talk about later. That's all about sexual reproduction. Mitosis is all about asexual reproduction. So that, again, that is how single-cell organisms reproduce. That's how they create new organisms, is through mitosis. For the rest of us, sexually reproducing organisms, mitosis is used for growth and maintenance. So right now, you are going through mitosis, I'm sure of it. Some of your cells are going through mitosis. So any questions about asexual reproduction or um, mitosis? All right. So let's really briefly talk about the next one. And in your textbook, your book doesn't, you know, doesn't talk about this yet, but I want to go ahead and talk about it. Because um, it's what we're going to discuss next chapter. And again, a lot of this exam is going to be differentiated between um, asexual reproduction and sexual. So I want to get the overview 
and so you keep this in the back of your mind as we move forward. So yes, this is the opposite of asexual reproduction. So instead of there being no sperm and egg, there is sperm and egg. And we call those things gametes, and that's another word you need to know, gametes, aka egg or sperm. Those are your sexual cells. And we produce those through a process called meiosis, which again, that'll be what we talked about next chapter. I'm not going to ask you the definition of meiosis. I'm not going to ask you the definition of mitosis. You need to know the difference between the two, and you need to know the stages, which is what we're going to cover later in this chapter, or in the case of meiosis, next chapter. But yeah, you definitely know what a gamete is. One, because I might ask you, um, and two, because you're going to run into that word a lot in the next couple, few chapters. Any questions? All right, again, I've mentioned this before, but here it is again. If we're talking about a, or excuse me, sexually reproducing organisms like humans, right? That's how we reproduce. That's how we make new organisms through sexual reproduction. For sexually reproducing organisms, Again, we use both, right? We do mitosis for growth and maintenance, and we do meiosis to reproduce, right? To make new organisms. And you need to know that. Sort of like the plant thing. Of course, I don't think that was a test question, but a lot of times people get that confused. Like, all right, animals do respiration and plants do photosynthesis, which is a true statement. But a more true statement is animals do respiration, plants do respiration and photosynthesis, right? They do both. A lot of times people kind of forget about that because you always focus on what sense when you talk about things. But same here. So yes, sexually reproducing organisms like us, we do go through meiosis to produce eggs and sperm, but we also go through mitosis. So anyway, any questions about that? All right, so far it's pretty easy, right? It's a little bit more complicated here, this next portion. We'll get into the second main bullet point. This is more aligned with what your actual textbook says. Again, the last one was a big overview, um, but this one is more aligned with the textbook. It's a lot of information. So let's talk about eukaryotic chromosomes. Does anybody remember what a eukaryote is? Or if you could briefly say, you know, what's the difference between a prokaryote and a eukaryote? Or give an example of a eukaryote versus a prokaryote. Anybody remember? Hopefully you remember it. You're just too shy to say something because it's a big <laughs> Big piece of information you shouldn't forget. So a prokaryote would be the single cell organism like a bacteria, for example. Eukaryotes would be like us, animals, plants, right? Things are more complicated. And that's what we're gonna focus on. Your book actually does talk about prokaryotic reproduction. And I'm skipping over it. We're just only talking about eukaryotic stuff. Anyway, in eukaryotic cells, such as our own, most of the genes are located inside chromosomes of the nucleus. You need to know that. That's a review though. I've already told you that before. Talk about cells. Learned that, but that is an important bullet point. Of course, I also told you um, that there are other genes, there is other DNA in your cells. So, for animals, for example, I don't test you on this, but there's DNA in your mitochondria. Remember that organelle that does cellular respiration? That DNA came from your mom because only the female passes down the mitochondria. And also, plants are the same way, right? So they have mitochondria, they also have chloroplasts, which is where photosynthesis happens, and the chloroplasts have their own DNA. And yeah, I'm gonna put an X to this. I didn't wanna bring it up, I didn't wanna remind you, but that will be a test question. So again, in eukaryotic cells, each chromosome contains one long DNA molecule that has thousands of genes. And that is a good independent work topic if you want to look into it. How many genes? How many genes do humans have? Or just pick your favorite other organism. How many genes do dogs have? How many genes do palm trees have? Whatever it is you want to look into. The chromosome number depends on the species. I'll put it next to that too, because I'm not going to ask you that. And on the next slide is going to give you some examples. It's not from your textbook, but I think it's pretty interesting. And again, a good independent work topic, I think. Pick your favorite organism. Look it up. How many chromosomes? How many chromosomes do dogs have? How many chromosomes do great white sharks have? How many chromosomes do you know, ferns have? Of course, it's different species of fern. But anyway, what another thing you do need to know is this last bullet point. 
Genome. I'm sure you hear the word a lot. I'm going to use it a lot. Genome is the cell's complete complement of DNA. Oh, so basically, you could say a genome is a cell, you know, all of the cells' DNA. Later in the semester, your textbooks that I talk about things like a transcriptome. Somebody had an independent work paper. What was the word that they used? Oh, man. Yeah, I think it was transcriptome. Or maybe it owns. I think it was just like dash own. Um, anyway, we can cover that when we get to it later in the semester. Any questions about this slide? All right, like I said, the next slide is going to give you an example of how the fact, you know, the fact that different species have different number of chromosomes. Um, you definitely don't need to know this. One, because it's not your textbook, and two, it's just not important. It's just slightly interesting. At the most, I might give you a picture like this and ask you a test question. And you don't need to memorize it, but you should be able to decipher it. So if I give you this picture and say, you know, how many how many chromosomes does a giraffe have? Well, oh, giraffe has 30. But again, you can look it up if you want. And also, in my opinion, plants are very really interesting when it comes to this stuff, too, because as you're going to learn later, you don't want to double the number of chromosomes. You don't want to mess with the number of chromosomes when it comes to patterns. It's bad, bad results. The plants, you can do that for a lot of plants. If you double the number of chromosomes, they are actually larger, as you might assume. But anyway, I do also like this because it's not really size related, right? So this animal has 102 chromosomes, like how small it is, versus a giraffe, which only has 30. Again, another good independent work topic. Not only what how many chromosomes do specific species have, but you can look up superlatives, like which species animal, plant, whatever, has the most number of chromosomes, which has the fewest. Anyway, any questions? All right, here we go with another review. You already learned this in the previous chapter, but here it is again. Chromosomes are made up of something called chromatin. You need to know that. Chromatin is basically half DNA, half protein. So when we're talking about chromosomes, you need to know that we're talking about technically chromatin is what makes it up. Chromatin is made up of DNA and proteins. And the proteins are important. Not that I'm going to necessarily ask you this, but it's going to come up later. These proteins organize the chromatin, so it helps give them their shape. Like that picture I showed you at the very beginning where I said those boogers, it's actually a classical shape of a chromosome, right? And the proteins help do that. And also, more importantly, later in the semester, so will come up again. They control the activities of the genes. Like I mentioned earlier, and I'm not going to ask you this, but a fully extended human chromosome is about, or excuse me, the DNA in one of your cells is about six feet long. It's trivial information. But think about how many cells you have. So then multiply six feet times that many cells. Yeah, that's a big, big number. Anyway, as is very important, we're going to talk about this next bullet point a lot, so this is just a preview. As the cell prepares to divide, the chromosomes have to coil up. You don't need to write any of this down yet, because again, this is just kind of like a preview. We're going to talk about this in great detail later. When they coil up, they form a compact structure that can be seen with a microscope. So again, I know most of you have done the labs, so you've seen these pictures of the uh, chromosomes under the microscope, and that's one of the ways you can identify a cell that's going through mitosis. If you can see the chromosomes, it's going through mitosis because they uh, did stuff. But when they're not dividing, again, talking about that lab, you can't see the chromosomes. Not the individual, you can't pick out a chromosome in a picture when it's not going through mitosis. Anyway, any questions about this slide before I show you a picture of what I'm talking about? All right, there you go. So this slide right here, or this cell right here, that's going through Interface, right? Because you can't pick out an identity, you know, one specific chromosome. It's just all a big squiggly mess. There's no need for it to be condensed. But here, this one is going to mitosis because you can see the individual chromosomes. Any questions about that? All right, here's some more words you need to know. I might test you on it. I'm not sure. This will be important later for sure. Now it's just an introduction, but later it will be important. Like I said earlier, chromatin is made up of about half DNA and half protein. So now we're kind of talking a little bit more about these proteins. They are called histones. They're just like little balls of protein. And literally, the DNA wraps around it. 
And when the DNA wraps around it, it is then called a nucleosome. It'll make a lot more sense when I show you the next slide. There'll be a picture of it. Um, the next word for attendance is actually next. So again, for this chapter, the histones, nucleosomes, not very important. But later in the semester, we'll be when we start talking about how genes work. That'll be important because your genes are written in your DNA. Imagine, as you see in this picture, if your DNA is wrapped around a bunch of proteins. That's going to make it harder to get to, right? You could probably imagine this might be hard for you to see, but it's probably easier to read the DNA in that little area right there, right? Because it's open versus the DNA, I don't know, in that area. Probably really hard for you to see that, but anyway, again, that'll be important later. For now, just know what a histone is, know what a nucleosome is. It's part of what makes up a chromosome. And if you take this picture and zoom out, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about chromosome, right? So this DNA is wrapped around these nucleosomes, and then those things themselves coil up, and then those things themselves also coil up. So when we say it's coiled up during mitosis, we're meaning it's really coiled up. Anyway, any questions about that? Good time. Good. Um, let's talk about duplicating chromosomes. Again, this is what almost what this entire chapter is about. Next one, too. It's all about the chromosomes. Speaking of which, I am going to talk a little bit about the other stuff that happens in the cell, but keep in mind, keep in mind, most of what we're talking about is chromosomes. So there are other things you can look into it if you want for um, independent work. Anyway, like I said earlier, here we go again. Before a cell can divide, the DNA has to be copied. You definitely need to know that. Later in the semester, we're also going to talk about exactly how that happens. A whole chapter on that. So when this happens, when the DNA is copied, obviously, first of all, hopefully that makes sense why it happens, right? Because if the cell is about to cut itself in half and wants to make a perfect copy of itself, then it needs to double everything, right? It needs to have double the amount of chromosomes, double the amount of organelles, right? So the chromosomes need to be copied. And what happens then, the result of this DNA being copied is what we call sister chromatids. You definitely need to know that word. It's going to be very big on the exam. Because when we talk about mitosis and meiosis, well, when we talk about mitosis, we only talk about sister chromatids. So the other words we talk about that I'll introduce you to later. But when you think of sister chromatids, you should think about mitosis. We'll see why later. So these sister chromatids, again, they're perfect copies of each other. They contain identical genes. They're joined together in something called a centromere. I'm not going to ask you what a centromere is, but I'm going to use that word. So that's why you need to know it. So you can picture it as I'm describing how this process happens on this day. It attaches to the centromere. You need to know what a centromere is. Anyway, any questions about this slide before I show you a little basic picture of uh, the, the duplication process. But again, you need to know what sister chromatids are. You need to know that they're perfect copies of each other. You need to know that they're joined and together at something called the centromere. Here's a picture. Of course, this picture doesn't even include the centromere, but it would be right there. The picture included it. That would be the centromere. Anyway, yeah, so you start off with one chromosome and then it doubles, right? So now you have those two sister chromatids. Any questions about that? Okay, so again, this is happening before mitosis even happens, right? The DNA has to duplicate, everything has to duplicate before the cell can divide. So as you can imagine, once the cell divides, those things actually are going to be separated, right? So you make a perfect copy of it, and then you pull it apart. And that's gonna be most of what mitosis is all about, right? Those sister chromatids separate, at that point, each of those sister chromatids is then considered just a full-fledged chromosome again. It's its own entity. And again, it's identical to the original chromosome, and this is what it looks like. So here you go, just regular old chromosome. And it needs to prepare for cellular division, so it duplicates itself. So now you have sister chromatids. Then it goes through cellular division, and those two sister chromatids separate. And what you can't see that you're gonna see later is this is in its own cell, and this one's in its own cell. And they all separate. Any questions about that? All right. Let's talk about something slightly more complicated, which is the cell cycle. 
This is an important concept. You need to understand the cell cycle to be able to understand uh, mitosis, to be, able to, to be able, to, ah, able to understand meiosis, also to be able to understand cancer. You need to understand the cell cycle. So here we go. The cell cycle is an ordered sequence of events, and it starts when a cell is first formed, and it ends once the cell divides into two. So in a sense, you can think of this as the lifetime for a cell, right? For a human, the lifetime is when you're born to when you die, right? For a cell, it's when it first appears to when it splits. The most important part of this slide, as far as testing is concerned, as far as, as, far as understanding what's coming up, is concerned is the point of error. The cell cycle is broken down into two main parts. You need to know this. The interphase and the mitotic phase. We're going to talk about both of those in great detail, but yes, you need to know that. Now, interphase itself is also broken down into different stages. We'll talk about that. And the mitotic phase is also broken down into different phases, and we'll talk about that. But sort of like the same way I recommended studying for photosynthesis and respiration, I recommend it for this too. Look at the big picture, memorize the big picture, then start adding details. So as you're studying, memorize the fact that the cell cycle consists of interphase and the mitotic phase. And once you have that, understood and you have that memorized then start memorizing and understanding the different parts of interface and the different parts of find out phase. so the next slide i'm going to show you is basically just a picture of this little point but are there any questions before i'll show you that picture all right there we go there's the cell cycle. we're going to talk about all this but again the interface and then the mitotic phase another thing you should know and i'm probably not going to test you on it but um Usually your cells are in interphase. About 90% of the time, your cells are in interphase. So mitosis is not a normal, um, a normal situation. And again, if you did the lab, that first little thing you did, remember you were your, not only did you identify what stage they were in, but remember they kept a little graph and showed you at the end like how many were in whatever phase. And if you remember correctly, or if you remember, most of them were in interphase, and that's why, because usually your cells are in interphase. Usually they're not going mitosis. So when they are in interphase, and you might need to know this, I'm not sure if I'm going to ask you or not, but they just go about their own business, right? Whatever kind of cell it is. Your kidney cells are doing kidney things, brain cells are doing brain, brain things. They're just doing the regular thing, right? Eventually, no need to write this down yet, because we're going to talk about this in great detail later, but they're going to double everything that they have, right? Because again, eventually, they're going to reproduce in the mitotic phase. Eventually, that cell is going to split into two. So eventually, you want to double everything. Double the chromosomes, like we already talked about. Double your organelles, all that stuff. And of course, obviously, as it gets doubles itself, it's going to get bigger, right? The cell is actually going to get bigger. So any questions about this big overview of cell cycle before we start talking about the specific G1 and S and G2? All right, here we go then. G1, I'm going to put a big question mark next to this. I don't know if I'm going to ask you that many, you know, go into detail. So I don't know if I'm going to ask you all these things about G1. You do need to know that G1 is first, right? So before I even get into this, you do need to know that it goes G1 and then S and G2. That is definitely something you need to know that interface consists of G1 then S, then G2. Sure. All of the details I'm about to give you, not quite sure you have to think about it. Anyway, yes, G1 is part of interphase. It's the beginning of interphase. It comes before S, as you can see. We'll talk about S phase later. At this point in the cell cycle, each chromosome is still a single chromosome. This is like the most, like, I hate to use this word, but this is the worst normal time for the cell. It's just, it's just the cell doing its thing, whatever kind of cell it is, it's doing its thing. It's not necessarily growing, it hasn't doubled everything yet, it's not preparing to divide. Again, if it's a kidney cell, it's just doing its kidney business, if it's a liver cell, it's just doing its liver business, whatever it is. Now it does grow a little, but not greatly. And uh, just like anything else, it's gonna accumulate energy, it's gonna accumulate material. What kind of, how's it accumulating energy? What molecules are making to accumulate energy? Hope you know this because you just had an exam on it. 
ATP, right? It's make, making a bunch of ATP. Anyway, any questions about G1? All right. I will ask you questions about this next one for sure. S phase. You need to know about S phase because as far as mitosis and meiosis are concerned, this is the most important one. This is where all the stuff's happening that we're talking about in this, in this chapter. So again, to remind you, S phase is part of the interphase. It comes after G1. So it's the second part of interphase. And again, like I said, as far as we're concerned, the conversation we're having in this chapter, this is the most important phase there is. Because this is when the chromosomes, or as your book put it, the citrosomes, the DNA, however you want to say it, that's when it is duplicated. You need to know that. That is a test question. That was also a pre lab question from, from the last lab, right? When is the DNA duplicated? It is duplicated in the S phase of interphase. And the way I always remember that as a student is because S stands for DNA synthesis, right? S synthesis. So again, that all that stuff we talked about earlier, where we say I showed you the picture of the single chromosome and then they duplicated to a chromatid, that's this. That's when this is happening. And it's so important that later in the semester we're gonna have a whole chapter discussing exactly how that happens. But for now, you just need to know it's part of S phase or that it, excuse me, the DNA duplication the DNA duplication happens during S phase, which is part of the phase. All right, then. Next and last for the cell cycle is G2, the second gap phase. I put a big question mark next to this. Again, just like the last one, I'm not sure if I'm gonna ask you all the details that I'm about to give you, but you do need to know, again, the order and sequence events. So you need to know that it goes G1, then S, then G2. At this point, as you should know, because again, you need to know what happens in S phase. So logically then, after S phase, after the chromosomes are duplicated, obviously you get G2, they're still duplicated, right? You're still dealing with Sister chromatids in G phase, or excuse me, G2 phase. You're not dealing with a single chromosome like you were in G1. You're dealing with sister chromatids. And you can see that in this picture, right? G1 is that single chromosome. G2, or excuse me, S phase, it duplicates. So then in G2, you're dealing with sister chromatids. And at this point, this is really when the cells are preparing to divide. Of course, they've already duplicated the DNA, but everything else they have to do, right? They need to. Uh, duplicate their organelles, needs to get larger, needs to accumulate even more material and even more energy. The cytoskeleton, which we briefly talked about in chapter three, um, and I'm not going to ask you about it, but again, it keeps that's the part that helps, well, just like any skeleton, right? Helps it maintain its shape. Um, in this case, the cytoskeleton is dismantled. So all the stuff needs to be duplicated and pulled apart, which is what we're going to talk about. Okay, so, any questions about this slide? All right, now we get into the really, really important stuff as far as the exam is concerned and as far as this chapter is concerned. Obviously, as far as life is concerned, one of these is not more important than the other, but as far as studying is concerned, this is important because this is what most of the exam is going to be about. Finally start talking about mitosis or the mitotic phase. So remember, talking about the whole cell cycle is broken down into the mitotic phase an interphase. We just got finished talking about interphase. So G1, S, G2, that's all interphase. Now we're talking about a completely different phase. It is the mitotic phase. And just like S phase, the mitotic phase is also broken down. It's broken down into mitosis, which is also broken down into other phases. So we'll talk about that later. And cytokinesis. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> Those two overlap. Mitosis and cytokinesis, they kind of Merge together, they're happening sometimes, you know, at the same time. Unlike G1, S, G2, right? That's just distinct phases. These two, they kind of kind of uh, overlap. But this, again, this is the process that's actually dividing the cells, dividing the chromosomes, where we get the two genetically identical, genetically identical cells. So again, as far as the exam is concerned, this is the most important. Any questions so far? All right, let's dive, dig into it. Mitosis and cytokinesis. Before we do, I'll go ahead and tell you this again, like I said earlier. A lot of stuff is happening in your cells, as you might imagine, because they're duplicating, they're making the perfect copy of themselves. A lot of stuff is happening. But all we're going to focus on mostly 
is what's happening to the chromosomes. So as I'm going through this discussion, keep that in the back of your mind. And other things are happening that we don't even talk about. You can look it up for the middle. What else is the cell doing during all this? Here we go. The first thing you need to memorize and understand before we even get into the details, again, study how you want, but my recommendation is memorize this in order. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, memorize that. And then start memorizing the differences between them. I will also point out that your textbook breaks it down into five distinct phases. So technically, between prophase and metaphase, there's something called pro-metaphase. But I want to make things simpler for you. So I'm actually going to not teach from the textbook in this case. Because I want to make things simpler. So for us, there's prophase, metaphase, and anaphase, telophase. Know those, know them in that order. And again, as I'm teaching this, keep in mind, the story here is going to be all about the chromosomes for the most part. That's what the exam is going to be. There's going to be a test question that says, in which stage are the chromosomes doing this? In which stage are the chromosomes doing that? That's how the exam's going to be. So keep that in mind as I'm teaching you this. Any questions so far? All right, before we can talk about prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, there's another thing, another concept you need to understand. I'm not going to necessarily ask you what this word is, but I'm going to use it so you need to understand what it is. The mitotic spindle. That is the thing that literally attaches itself to the chromosomes and moves them around. So obviously it's really important, right? Because, well, the whole story is about moving chromosomes around. So obviously the thing doing it is going to be important. So yes, I'm not going to ask you what my mitotic spindle is, but I'm definitely going to use that word a lot. And that's a picture of it, not from your textbook, but you can see. And your book actually goes into great detail. These things are called citrosomes, and your book talks a lot about how these fibers come out and connect to the chromosome. I'm not going to go into that much detail. All you need to know, as far as I'm concerned, is what a mitotic spindle is. That way, when I'm using the word, you understand what I mean. It's the thing that's moving stuff around, that's moving the chromosomes around. So, yes, again, if you take notes, you might write down, hey, when you're reading this in the textbook, you don't need to go into all the details of the paper. Any questions so far? All right, here we go. Let me ask you this. If we were having a race, I don't know, against the Millers, the Crystal Taylor. If they were having a race, and I put this down in front of Crystal, and I put this down in front of Taylor, right here in the middle, and I said, all right, your job is to separate those. We'll go on half the yarn on this side, half the yarn on that side. Who do you think would win? The person who has this or this? A or B, right? Who do you think would be the fastest? The person who has a or B. This is all the same amount of yarn, or let's assume it is, right? Who's going to be fastest? And I say, we need to separate those perfectly half and half. Who's going to win? B. B, right? And why is that? Organized. Yeah, it's organized, right? It's not a big squiggly mess. Like, imagine trying to, like, untangle that. And that's exactly what happens on your chromosomes. Not that I'm going to ask you that in much detail, but hopefully that'll help you remember. Before your cells can divide, like I've already said, those chromosomes that are usually a squiggly mess in interface, they condense into unique, identifiable chromosomes. And that's why, right? Because they need to be separated. So hopefully that'll help you remember what I'm about to teach you here. What happens during prophase? The first thing is the chromosomes coil up. You need to know that. There will be a test question that says, in which phase do the chromosomes coil up? The answer is prophase. And logically, again, that just makes sense. So I hope you know. The next word for tenants, I'm just going to circle it. Okay. Anyway, as we already know, because we've already had this discussion, at this point, when the chromosomes coil, they exist as citrochromatids joined together at the um, centromere. Again, as a review, we already told you that, right? That happened in S phase. They already duplicated in S phase. So that's all it is. But again, at this point, they're coiled up. You can know that. Let me also back up to also imagine we're having this this uh this race, if you will. Let's forget about the squigglies. But imagine crystal has these marls of yarn. Actually, yeah, we'll just stick with crystal, sorry. But imagine if I had them in a plastic bag, like a Kroger bag, and I gave them to her said, Hey, Crystal, I need you to separate these, put them half and half, right? What would you, what would be the first thing you did? 
If I gave you a bag of those balls of yarn. You take them out of the bag. You take them out of the bag, right? Logically. So logically, that's something else that you need to know happens in prophase. The nuclear envelope, the thing that holds the chromosomes in place, so to speak, the thing that houses the chromosomes, if you want to say it like that, it disappears. It breaks into pieces, right? Because you want to separate the chromosomes so you can't keep them together in the nucleus. You want to get rid of it. So you definitely know that. Um, in your book, I'll put a little star there to remind myself. No, that's the next one. Yeah, not your book. Okay, yeah, sorry. Your book goes into great detail about how that happens. It describes how the nuclear envelope disintegrates. You don't need to know that. You don't need to know the details of it. I just require that you know that the nuclear envelope breaks apart into the prophase. Excuse me, in prophase is when that happens. So again, as you're studying, you can read it if you want in the textbook. Keep in mind, I'm not gonna ask you that much detail. Anyway, another thing that happens, and this is all logical, right? This is very logical. All these things logically have to happen. So if we're gonna be moving a bunch of chromosomes around, then logically, the thing that's gonna move them around needs to attach to them. So that is another thing that's happening in prophase. The mitotic spindle is attaching to the chromosomes. Specifically, not that I'm gonna ask you this much detail, but they uh, they attach at the centromeres right there in the middle. And again, technically, remember your book goes in a little bit more detail, and your book breaks this down into two phases, right? Your book has prophase, and your book has prometaphase. When you're reading this, this bullet point technically happens in prometaphase. But as far as I'm concerned, we're just keeping it simple, and we're just saying it happens in prophase. Also, it goes into really great detail about something called the kinetic core. I'm not going to go into that much detail. So again, logically, this should make sense anyway. The thing that's moving the chromosomes around attaches to the chromosomes in the first phase. Now, here's the next part. Hopefully, hopefully, some of one of you gets this. Think like logically here. The last thing I'm going to say about prophase is since the chromosomes are now attached to the thing that's going to move them around. They start moving towards the center of the cell, right? So that's what's happening. All this is happening, and the last thing I'm saying is those chromosomes are start moving towards the center of the cell. So logically, what do you think is going to define the next phase? What do you think I'm going to tell you about the next phase? And remember, it's all about the chromosomes. So if they're moving towards the center of the cell right now, then what must the next cell, the next stage be? Of course, you already did the lab, so you should know anyway, but logically, if they're moving towards the center of the cell, and that's defining the end of this prophase, then what must be metaphase? What must be the next? What happens in the next? See so if anybody can guess. And again, it shouldn't be much of a guess because you did the you did the lab. But what's the next phase? What happens to the to the uh, chromosomes in the next phase? Any guesses? Someone's got to get it surely, because again, logically. It just makes sense. And also, when you've already done the lab. So, what is the next phase? Not, I mean, it's metaphase, but what happens in the next phase? Maybe I'll show you a picture too. So, this is prophase. Again, metaphase, we've already talked about it. Prophase, the mitotic spindle forms, and then it eventually it attaches to the chromosomes. The nuclear envelope disappears. The chromosomes have condensed. Right? All those things you need to know about prophase. At this point, they're all starting to move towards the center of the cell. So, what must the next phase be? Don't overthink it. Don't be afraid to be wrong either. I love wrong answers because then I know where your brain is and I can help direct you. Direct you. Like it's like helping somebody who's lost. It's easier to help somebody who's lost if you know where they are, right? So someone want to guess what must the next phase be? What must metaphase be if right here they're moving towards the center of the cell? Don't overthink it. Yes, they make it to the center of the cell, right? So if prophase ends with the chromosome going towards the center of the cell. And not logically, that is the next phase. Metaphase is when they have met up in the cell. And that's how I always remember. To me, and it's not what it means, it's a Greek prefix, but I always remember that they met in the center of the cell. Metaphase, they met in the center of the cell. Technically, they call that the metaphase plate. I'm only bringing that up because your book did too, but I'm not going to ask you what a metaphase plate is. What you need to know, what the exam is going to say, is on what stage or what phase 
do the chromosomes meet in the middle? And the answer is metaphase. And at this point, when they're met up, when they're lined up in the middle, which you can't see in this picture, is it's like a tug of war. These centromeres are pulling those things, right? And like pulling them, trying to pull them apart. Logically, then, if in this phase they're trying to get pulled apart, they're getting pulled. And logically, what must the next stage be? It's called anaphase. But what must happen to the chromosomes? If right here, they're getting pulled. What must happen logically? And that'll be the last thing we talk about for the day. Don't overthink it. There's a tug of war happening in this phase. So what must define the next phase? What must define anaphase? You can get it. No one? Yeah. So if in this phase they're getting pulled apart, the next phase is they it actually happens. They they separate. So yeah, and we'll talk about that when we come back on Wednesday. You guys have a good week. Oh yeah. I won't do any more tennis words. If you haven't taken the exam yet, you need to contact me. Immediately. Have you uh take a look at my retake yet? No, not the re-retake. Yeah. Yeah. Keep an eye on your uh on the grade, you know, online, because once I do, I'll change it. And uh, my uh,